invited to be here, although after that talk, I'm, <laughs> I'm never speaking after you again. So I'm going to give you a, a view of, in essence, the, the science that uh, we're developing that informs uh, the future of, of food uh, and how perhaps to think about how things are going to change around the world and, and, and opportunities for New Zealand. Um, so basically, um, the world food is going to change dramatically uh, over the next very few years and, and the drivers of that uh, I will summarize as, as being threefold, three major disruptive changes that we see coming to the entire agriculture and food sector. Um, one is, is a detailed understanding of, uh, of basically uh, how complex systems uh, in biology work. Uh, we can not only understand them, we can now measure them with the precision necessary to, uh, to control them. Um, secondly, uh, we're now realizing that diet is an ensemble of molecular components and, uh, and mechanisms and not individual food materials. And finally, uh, as already Stefan has, uh, has alerted you, um, the, the, the computational algorithms that are possible now to connect individuals to, in essence, massive databases are now changing all industries. Interestingly, food perhaps even last. So real quick, how did we get in the position we're in in, uh, in this food uh, space? Um, spectacular success. The 20th century saw the most magnificent success in human history in building scientific knowledge and bringing it to practice. And the science that was successful is chemistry. Chemistry was successful both scientifically in, in the research sense, but, but most importantly industrially because of its inherent nature. Chemistry changed the human condition. We are all wearing, sitting on, watching chemistry in action. Why was that possible? Because at its core, chemistry is a reductive science. Take things apart, understand them, now you know how they work, but the genius is because it's a separation science, you make things simple and you can predict how they're gonna behave. With that basic principle of chemistry, the science changed the world. Uh, one of the areas that was most successful was taking food apart into individual chemicals and then using what engineers call a fault model. Fault, take a complex system, take something out. If it was essential, the system breaks. That same approach was taken to the hundreds of thousands of molecules that surround us. And we now know the 40 that are essential nutrients. Every vitamin, every mineral, every essential amino acid and fatty acid is known. Mature scientific knowledge all made possible by chemistry. Magnificent success, and the public health effects are dramatic. Um, I ask, poll my uh, undergraduate students every year, how many of you have seen a goiter? Most of them ask me what a goiter is. So that success is spectacular in ways you don't think of, and that's the point. 150 years ago, every young person would go to the silvered glass in the morning and check their neck. How's my goiter? Why? Because they saw them. They were terrified of that disfiguring swelling in their throat that would last a lifetime. Modern teenagers today don't even know what a goiter is. That magnificent science eliminated not only the disease, but even the fear of the disease. Success has been truly successful and spectacular. But how was brought to practice is interesting. Did that science mean that we had to build a dosing system? so that each person got exactly the amount of iodine they need for their uh, thyroid, every, the amount of calcium they need for their bones. No, why? Because if you give someone more of an essential nutrient than they need, they take what they need and then they just pee or poop out the excess. What that means is you can take a public health strategy of basically overdosing everyone. Now everybody gets what they need, you poop out the excess, and you're good to go. So the public health strategy, very successful. We don't even know what rickets looks like. Magnificent success. But there were some consequences. First, big agriculture move, emerged. We don't have to worry about essential nutrient deficiency diseases anymore. Now let's get going and make more food. And this horizontally integrated, massive global agricultural system has been very successful. Make more food. Uh, if you'd asked uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, could we imagine a world with six billion people? They would have been terrified. It would have been impossible to imagine feeding them. We can feed them. 
The production agriculture system has been wonderfully successful at the quantity model. Interestingly, the assets of that has been converted in the public's mind into branded food products. So to most people in urbanized uh, environments, they don't think about food in any other way than what industry wants them, the brands they buy. And this has led to a very unusual view of the food supply by the customer. They think of individual food brands as being the value. And this is the basis of the competition, good foods, bad foods, all based on these brands. And massive international assets are in these brands. Procter & Gamble doesn't think of itself as a product company, it thinks of itself as having $23 billion brands. When they acquire a company, they fire the employees, they sell the factories, they've bought the brand. That brand economic model is valuable for business, it's a disaster from a food and health perspective. And it's going to change. There are other consequences, because we no longer had to worry about essential nutrient diseases, diet and health became an educational elective. And we all know what students with an elective do, they elect not to take it. We are the most profoundly undereducated population in history about agriculture, food, and health. We are urbanized and we don't care. And that leads to a disaster in how you can educate people now as to what they should be eating. They have no basis on which to put that in place. And interestingly, science had an interesting consequence. The science of nutrition and the science of food divorced. And it was not pleasant. It was a hostile divorce. And these two sciences that are as intrinsic as math and numbers um, have been separate for a long time. And this was a big mistake. And now we have this environment. Lots of apparent choices in the food supply and an ignorant population. Is there any reason why we are in the shape we're in? We should be the healthiest people in human history. And actually some are. Uh, Roger and Jaring are playing the sports they learned as children. They're both over 100. So by some criteria, some people are spectacularly healthy. But um, you've already seen the statistics. We are not doing very well at all. The population of 60% overweight, obese, and pre-diabetic is a catastrophe on a global scale. And diet's the problem. And of course, the agricultural model, the crowning achievement of 50 years of American genetics, the corn plant, is going to drive SUVs as ethanol. What a disaster. So what's the next era of nutrition? It's going to be beyond the essential nutrients. How are we going to give people diets that genuinely improve their health? That's been our goal. And of course, when you articulate that, what does that mean? In most simple terms, it means prevention. We're going to have diets that prevent disease. We're not going to wait until you're sick. We're going to act proactively to make you healthier. Sounds wonderful, you'd run for public office on it. The problem is no one has the foggiest idea what it really means. What is the efficacy that we have to deliver on? That is to say, mechanistically, right now we have a disease-based healthcare system. We wait until someone has a disease, we have diagnostics to identify it, and therapeutic cures to reverse it. Prevention means we're not gonna wait. We're gonna take healthy people and make them healthier. How? What do you act on every day that makes a healthy person healthier? We have no targets of efficacy. And oh, by the way, if you do so, and in so doing, improving the health of an individual in one sense, lowering the risk of one disease, but increase the risk of anything else, I haven't made you healthier at all. While the efficacy dossier is important, the safety dossier is far more important. We have to literally make people healthier in all aspects. And the final problem, perhaps the biggest one, is the value proposition. Who's going to pay and what are they going to value for a disease they're never going to get? Where's the money going to come? So those are the challenges we've been looking at. So the great news is the scientific tools are changing dramatically. So the century, the 21st century, the science is biology. It's a complex science. It recognizes complex systems living individuals, ecosystems, that's how biology works. And we have the tools now to begin to examine that. Chemistry is changing, going from a reductionist science, looking for the one drug, the one compound that's important. Now it's being able to describe biology in quantitative and uh, qualitative detail. So chemistry is joining this biological century. 
The big science, however, it's changing is mathematics. Mathematics is changing the world because we can now understand and interpret this great complexity. Uh, it's not just big data of, uh, of, of, of digital devices. Um, that's uh, actually not an image. That's an NMR spectrum uh, acquired in a three-dimensionally oriented magnetic field. And that data set that was obtained can now be presented computationally, computationally as the, the tissue that it represents. And actually, that's a non-invasive image. That's my heart. And one of the values is it's a digital file. I can just take that file, send it to uh, anywhere I want. I send it to Matthias Friedrich, a cardiologist friend of mine. Turns out I have a, I have a scar in my upper left part where, uh, where Susan Scott broke my heart in eighth grade. <laughs> but the bottom line is, this is what large data and computational biology means to, uh, to the world of health. Uh, and engineering. Engineering has gone from, uh, in essence, massive production systems for petroleum and cracking uh, soybeans to small devices we carry with us. So engineering, all the tools necessary for the 20th, 21st century are now arriving. What do they do? So let's go to this detailed understanding of complex biological processes. So we have changed from the reductionist chemistry, what causes disease, to integrative biology. How does it work? What is, in essence, the system that we're looking at? Where are the weak points? What are the nodes that we interact upon? Can we describe them in enough detail to understand them, to measure them, and improve them? So food is moving from what it is What's the composition to what it does? How does it affect me? So we have used at the university what we call an evolutionary model. That is, we take the entire evolutionary tree from simple organisms to us and ask a very simple question. What evolved throughout evolutionary history to be nourishing, to be preventative when you eat it? Well, when you take that approach, it's bad news. Because basically everything evolved to avoid being eaten. And not surprisingly, most things are very good at it, especially plants. In fact, they've evolved remarkable strategies to inhibit, in essence, our successful growth, our, our diseases. In fact, if, if you want to know how to get rid of your major professor, then plants are probably going to tell you. So the evolutionary history of organisms doesn't tell you about prevention. There's only one thing that does. This remarkable elaboration, very, very late in evolution, lactation wherein mammalian mothers literally dissolve themselves to make a complete diet for their infant. And that's literally our model, the mother-infant pair. She's dissolving herself to make it. Everything costs her. If it doesn't profit the infant, the cost of the mother drives it out of evolution. But if anything about that diet improves the competitive advantage of that healthy infant, then the efficacy by which that does that is a strong selective pressure and it's rewarded by evolution. So we've been, in essence, looking at that. The mother-infant pair has been evolving as a comprehensive diet to protect and promote the health of infants generation after generation for 200 million years. And that's now what we're examining. How does this work in babies and is that relevant for everybody else? So we use a team model. We bring scientists from across the spectrum um, remember our model, the mother-infant pair, she's being, in essence, dissolved to make it. Imagine our surprise, we take human milk apart. The third most abundant solid component is completely undigestible by babies. It goes right through them. Why would mothers dissolve themselves to make undigestible matter for their babies? So first, what is it? University of California, we have the luxury. Carlito Labrilla is the best analytical chemist in the world, studying complex biopolymers. What's in milk that's undigestible? Complex oligosaccharides. Sugar polymers in very stereospecific linkages, and those linkages are impossible for babies to digest. They don't have the enzymes to break them down. So we now know what they are, this family of compounds in milk that's undigestible. What do they do? So we thought, well, they must be feeding bacteria. They're not feeding babies. They're, the only thing left is to feed the bacteria. So we enlisted the help of David Mills, world-famous microbiologist. He studies the ecology of bacteria and everything from wine vats to humans. We isolated the oligosaccharides, gave them to David. The bacteria grow on them. 
No. He's trying bacterium after bacterium after bacterium. They can't grow on them any better than babies can. And then he finds one. Oh, what a surprise in the intestine of breastfed babies. And we've been mapping this complex system. So this bacterium, in fact, has a very unusual genome. 800 genes unique from other bifidobacteria. And among those genes are all the genes encoding enzymes to break down those complex oligosaccharides in human milk. This is a bacterium clearly evolved to this unusual ecosystem, the intestine of a breastfed baby. And we've been mapping this. Every single linkage in every sugar in human milk, we now know. We have mapped those, and we've mapped them to the genes in the bacteria encoding the enzymes to break them down. We have now a full mapping of the oligosaccharides and a full mapping of the bacteria that digest them. It is a complex process. We have now mapped the metabolism of all those sugars going through the bacteria. So we can map not only the bacteria's growth, but the metabolites that it reintroduces back into the intestine of the baby. So this very complex system, an entire ecosystem in the intestine of a breastfed baby, we've mapped it in molecular and mechanistic detail. So this is a poopogram. This is a single baby measuring the oligosaccharides coming out of that baby at various points during lactation and the bacteria in them. And interesting, in this particular baby, day after day, week after week, the oligosaccharides went in and the oligosaccharides went out. But after about three weeks, the bacteria began to change. Simultaneously with the collapse of the oligosaccharides and their disappearance, up went Bifidobacterium longum subspecies infantis. And it didn't grow a little bit. There weren't just more bacteria. 90% of the weight of the diaper was this organism. Clearly, this is a remarkable strategy. Mothers are recruiting another life form to babysit their baby. And they're nourishing this bacterium so that it, in fact, participates with the baby to protect it, to nourish it, to educate its immune system. So, oligosaccharides, feeding bacteria, and a very specific population emerging. So now we have a new way of thinking about babies. It's not just mothers and infants, it's also the bacteria within babies. This is critical to their health, the development of their immune system. Who needs it? Well, of course, breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. It's very important for babies. Mark Underwood is head of neonatology at the Medical Center at Davis. Basically, he takes premature babies from mothers, typically by cesarean section. That means he takes them sterile from the mother, puts them in an incubator, and they begin to acquire bacteria into their intestine from where? The hospital. This is not the way you'd like to start life. So with Mark, we started literally giving these babies our product, the combination of human milk oligosaccharides and the bacteria. And lo and behold, the bacteria multiplies, fills up the baby, and they're just like a full-term breastfed baby. So in fact, he's now protecting these, uh, these babies. There wasn't a source of these bacteria, so we launched a company to do that. And now this company is making the bacteria available to babies uh, and NICUs around the country. So what have we learned? We're not alone. Feeding the right bacteria in your intestine is critical for babies. It's also critical for the rest of us. We have to take these bacteria and turn them into our health minions. Um, and we're doing a terrible job at it. We, in fact, live in a virtual sterile environment, and uh, we process all indigestible materials, i.e. food for these bacteria, out. So we have to change the food supply. It sounds terrible. We're going to eat bacteria and food for bacteria. Well, it's not. If you look at some of the most successful ancestral foods, coffee, chocolate, cheese, bread, beer, wine, yogurt. They're not commodities. They're a combination of commodity plus more microorganism and culture. And that process simultaneously improves the nutrition of the food, the stability of the food, the safety of the food, and the delight from the food. So a future in which we get the bacteria right will be simultaneously safer, more nourishing, more stable, and more delicious. So it's a good future. And it will be more sustainable. The ability of microorganisms to stabilize foods will dramatically lower the cost of throwing food away. So 
the technologies necessary to do that, to be able to measure all the bacteria in babies, were something that Dave Mills had to develop. So literally taking uh, microorganisms from, from, back, from babies' poop used to be you'd culture individual bacteria one at a time. Now David takes a swab and sequences everything and then computationally figures out everything that's there. And he did it in high throughput. Such high throughput that we literally ran out of baby poop. So he said, well, what else could I do? So he began to take swabs all over. So he swabbed at meter length accuracy the winery in the department, and then the neonatal intensive care unit in the hospital, a cheese plant nearby. He mapped literally all the microorganisms on all the surfaces in, uh, in those environments. That's the kind of technology platform available today. So you won't wonder what bacteria are coming into your food plant. You'll know whenever you want. And you'll be able to identify what spoilage organisms, what safety organisms. So our ability to describe our environmental environment, microbially, is now here. He launched a company to do this. And this company is now giving, uh, in essence, companies the knowledge of what the bacteria are in their environment. So second big change that's coming is we will destroy this idea that food as an individual food is the value of, of diet. Uh, in fact, it's not just about food. It's an ensemble of uh, aspects. No, there is no such thing as one bad food and one good food. It's the overall diet that's important. And that's what we have to get right. This artificial business construct of branded products will collapse very soon. It's just the truth. And Milk is telling us how dietary components interact. We were very interested now in premature babies. 13% of babies born in the United States in 2016 will be born premature. And so we have to understand how to nourish them. And one of the questions we had was, can they even digest it? Their intestine, their stomach is undeveloped. Can their enzymes break down milk itself? Can they break down the proteins at all? So again, with Mark, we took milk back out of babies and asked the question, does the milk protein get digested? The answer is, oh my gosh, does it ever? These are the peptides produced in the baby's stomach. The baby is actually doing a great job of digesting the, uh, the proteins. But then we began to disassemble these proteins. What really are they, and what are the peptides they're making? So we took that entire chromatogram of, uh, of peptides, ran it through tandem mass spectrometry, so one after another, we get a spectrum at every point. Because we know the entire genome of the milk proteins, we can map that particular peptide to its point of origin. We did that again and again and again and built up the entire library of peptides inside of babies. So we can do that now. We can take a baby and ask, how well is it digesting? But one of the things we realized is very specific proteins are being digested at very specific points. And that means we can map the enzymes. And when we did that, we realized that these are the enzymes that are digesting protein in baby stomachs. The interesting feature of that is babies don't have those enzymes. So where are the enzymes coming from? Well, it turns out Wamadramo identified every single one from the mother. Mothers are basically making milk self-digesting. It digests itself. And that's the genius of milk again. It's helping babies digest the proteins. So what do we learn? We need help digesting. Um, Justin Siegel has launched a company that sells an enzyme that breaks the celiac peptide and gluten in half in the protein as a food ingredient. So people who are, in essence, celiac because they cannot digest the protein uh, peptides in gluten and they develop an autoimmune reaction to it now have, a, in essence, a food-grade enzyme that help them do that, just like your mother did with milk. So the future is, of course, going to be in essence, bioengineering of enzymes to help us uh, eliminate the problems. Gluten intolerance is real. If you don't digest the proteins, they cause a problem. We're in essence, processing enzymes away. The next future will be we'll processing enzymes back into the food supply. Finally, computational uh, capabilities. This is genuinely changing all of the consumer products. Finally, it will come to food. And it's really not about the food. It's about the consumer. Uh, Food will become a knowledge industry. And, and we all know what a knowledge industry is. It's just not food yet. 
What does a knowledge-based food industry look like? Or Google Maps. Right? This is a massive database of all the roads, the highways, the bike paths available in a publicly accessible data cloud. And it's complete, it's personally accessible. Where, in essence, am I? Where do I want to go? It's dynamic, you can get real-time traffic on it now. And of course, the business model is that it's annotated. So if I want a cup of coffee, it tells me where the different opportunities are. And the companies pay for the entire operation just to get access to those customers. So a knowledge-based industry we're all very familiar with for transportation. And the value proposition is simple. Where am I now? Where would I like to be? How do I get there? And Google Maps lets you choose. You can take a highway, you can take a country road, you can take a bike. So there's still massive options available, but it's knowledge-based. So, for health, what's my health status now? What would I like it to be? How do I get there? And foods will be mapped the same way. So diet knowledge is going to have to be built so we can predict exactly what foods do analogous to roads. What's my health? What would I like it to be? How do I get there? Now, it's not much closer than you'd think. This is a personal, in essence, beverage dispenser. It's a simple carafe that, uh, that most of you probably have, right? but it's a smart one. When you put your beverage in, it knows what you poured in. It can tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi, and it knows how much you've poured in. So when you drink it, it knows how much you've drank. And because it knows the composition, it can alert you. It knows how much caffeine you've consumed in a day, how much water available today, in California, $100. Right now, it's not smart, but imagine that it was simultaneously keeping track of your activity and your fructose consumption. If you're not active, you won't be allowed to drink fructose. Matching carbohydrate fuel to energy, very simple application. Delivering individual products as foods to people is already coming. Um, you are all familiar with this technology, little pods that have coffee in them, and you deliver a cup of coffee. These are pods, they're not delivering coffee. They're coming through this device, they're making tortillas. They're capsules of dough. So can your entire family sit around and have a family meal based on tortillas, whereas each person gets the appropriate dough for them? Absolutely. Gluten intolerant, you don't get gluten. Pre-diabetic, you don't get starch. Absolutely, and again, available today. The last part of this, we're going to have to get smarter the, as individuals. Who makes the decisions about your diseases? Who does the diagnostics, the procedures, the drug decisions? A highly trained, qualified clinical professional, a doctor. Who makes the decisions about diet and health? You do. And remember, you're ignorant and uneducated. We're going to have to change that. So we have an education system where we're putting devices on kids so they can literally begin to understand their own personal health. We tell them all the things that are important, what they like, what they don't like, what their taste preferences are. And we deliver it to them as individuals. The idea is you graduate from grade 12 as the clinical clinician of health of one, you, because it's the truth. And the differences already are dramatic in what we see amongst kids. This is just activity of, on every day of a group of 10-year-old uh, of kids. And it's staggering. There are some children whose activity, that is to say, their spontaneous volitional activity, play, differs by a factor of three. There are children who are literally playing three times as much every day. We have got to understand what drives this so every child can play as much as they'd like. So the future is clear. We need to build education systems. New Zealand is an obvious place to educate the world about how to educate themselves on diet and health. So food's about to change, dramatic disruptive change. We're understanding mechanisms of biology well enough to measure it and follow it and ultimately intervene. It's an ensemble. This food-based model is obsolete. It will change. And the ability to use big data systems are clearly going to be driving the consumer product industry for entertainment, for transportation, communication, and next diet and health. 
We will be improving health, not just managing disease. Personal control of these will be a spectacular industry, and we will create economic value by doing it. Thank you.